Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first time filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with us is our first time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey, Josh. Hello, Christian. Your video is looking smooth. Your sound is sounding good. Good. This is our third try, I yes. think, to start this podcast. So, yeah, We've only been in the pandemic, what, 13 months? And we're just now figuring this out. <laughs> it seems well, like we've reversed. Like I we think, were doing, yeah. okay, but now, I don't know, we've been thrown back. No, here's what you got to do. You need to get on, you know, a like a parent zoom call listening to the athletic director or the principal or something and just watch all these parents who have no idea what they're doing (laughs) then you'll feel better about how we're doing that makes me feel good i can't believe i have never thought about that during this pandemic what it must be like for all of you parents that have kids at home to try to do these zoom things virtually i just that what a horrible experience that must be we, we just decided keep the camera and audio off. Just make the call and all we got to do is listen and don't have to worry about anything. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. Well, it's good yeah. to see you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and we have not introduced Jason. You've heard Jason. You know him. He is with a full beard and virtual beard. Glad to have you with us, Jason. <laughs> Glad to be here, Josh. <laughs> Apparently... <laughs> Apparently, there is some new toy in Zoom where you can have virtual effects like enhancing your beard. And so that's what Jason was playing with while we were having all these technical difficulties. But anyway, let's get to our podcast. (laughs) Well, I was interested in this beard, but we can move on. Uh, Christian, we have a guest today, but before we do that, we need to get an update on the film. Yeah, well, there's not been a ton going on, but I will tell you that uh, I am back from Wyoming, which was a fabulous trip. I highly recommend Pinedale, Wyoming as a destination place. However, it was recently featured in the New York Times uh, because a lot of people during the pandemic have just decided to go there and set off into the wilderness and uh, just with their iPhones and maybe some hiking boots. And while they were there, uh, they've gotten lost. Uh, Terrible things have happened. They end up calling 911 and the city has to just go into overdrive if it costs them tons of money. And so I think people were just checking that out. So if you go to Pine Down, Wyoming, don't be crazy. Um, please be plan, uh, plan ahead. And uh, anyway, so yeah, there I'm back from Pine Down, Wyoming. Um, and while I was um, traveling, unbeknownst to me, we won the Red Movie Awards and we won Best Documentary. We won Best uh editing and initially they put my name on there and bill ebel called me and said hey good job with the editing (laughs) Uh, so i had to get that fixed and then we also won best new filmmaker so those were exciting Uh, i did find out today the red film awards is located in france so of course they loved our documentary and it is a monthly competition which i normally didn't do the only reason i decided to do it is because we were having such trouble getting into film festivals in france Um, and what happens in a monthly award film festival is you um, they have monthly competitions to see who wins you're then entered in the yearly competition to see if you win over the course of the year and then they have an award ceremony in reams in may and may of 2022 and even though you know and whether or not i win at the end i'm invited because i've won uh during a monthly thing so that was exciting this week and then we uh, we've got you know, we've been planning for our film festival that's coming up this weekend. So I want to tell everybody um, this will be coming out at the end of this week. So this is Uh, timely news. On Saturday, April 17th, I will be driving to Galena, Illinois, where we will be having a screening of the film on Saturday at three o'clock in the DeSoto house in the Parker room. I will be there and we will have a cast member, Rhoda Reed, whose husband was uh, laid to rest with uh, on Utah Beach. And she will be there with me. We will have a little Q&A afterwards. And then I will head that night to Dubuque, Iowa to begin setting up everything that is going to be going on there. In Dubuque, Iowa, we're a part of the Julian International Film Festival that does begin on the 18th. Our film has three screenings um, on the 21st, which is a Wednesday, I think. 
And then on the uh, Saturday and Sunday, the 24th and 25th will be screening. You can find all the details at thegirlwhowarefreedom.com slash festivals. And you can look at Julian International Film Festival there. Uh, The most exciting things about this film festival are that we will have a World War II encampment that will be there from Friday night until Sunday. And it looks like we may have um, 101st GIs. We'll have Germans represented there. We will have Italian, uh, we'll have uh, GIs that were in the Italian campaign, as well as maybe even a Russian a soldier there. So we're just kind of educating the public about World War II, showing them some vehicles. Those will be very exciting, as well as the costumes and the tents and other things like that. So uh, people will be able to mingle around and look at all that stuff. So that will be cool. And then we also have French people from Normandy joining us for Ginny Durr and her friend Denis Grazo will be in attendance on Saturday. And it looks like the French General Council to the Midwest Midwest, Guillaume Lacroix will be joining us also. And we're hoping for C.O. Bauer and Rob DeVinny to join us. So it could be like we're going out on a bang. This could be our last in-person film festival. And so we are just, you know, going all out on this one. So this is definitely the one to be at in person. Awesome. And say, say the date again and location. So the dates are um, April 17th in Galena, Illinois. And then April 18th through 25th uh, in um, Dubuque, Iowa, at the Julian International Film Festival. And we have been nominated for the top documentary award. It's one, you know, there's three of us, so we do have a good chance at an award. And that award ceremony will be on Saturday night, the 24th, um, which people can attend as well. They are following all the COVID protocols, so it's a very safe place to come. And yeah, we're really excited. We like our chances. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, before we introduce our special guest, I have a question about uh, distribution. Yeah. Uh, so I know you've had a lot of things you needed to give them. Are you aware of, do they give you progress updates in terms of like, we've reached out to so-and-so, we've reached out to these companies and so on and so forth? That's a great question, Josh. And sadly, at every distributor I am sure is different. Uh, but the thing that I've heard from David Patterson, who we should bring on back, you know, shortly, um, is that really you're in the dark. You're in the dark. They're doing their stuff. And until something pops, you don't really hear anything. So they have told me that they have pitched to broadcast channels and cable, um, you know, cable channels. And they also have their own streaming services. So one of the big things, the big discussions that we've been having in the old days you know, there was a a hierarchy. You would pitch your film to uh, the broadcast channels or the cable channels first. They would have sort of an exclusive right to show those things and they would pay more money for that. And then you would make short deals for a year or two for those, you know, outlets to be able to show your film. And then they would release the, you know, their rights and you would go to the next level, which would be streaming. And then after that, you would go to the next level, which would be airlines and, you know, um, maybe libraries and schools, educational stuff. Well, everything's changed now with the streaming services and COVID dramatically reshaped the entertainment industry. So what my distributor told me was they really are thinking about doing a everything at once kind of thing. So they have made pitches is what they call them and sort of to all of these broadcast channels and cable channels and hopefully are, um, you know, we'll find some interest there and we will get picked up. Um, They do have relationships with those broadcast and cable companies in Canada and the U S and, but they also have their own account like on iTunes or on YouTube and Amazon prime where they can upload their things for a cost. So people then can just buy the film and that goes into their pot. So we know that we are going to be opening from Memorial Day through D-Day this year, in at the very least, through iTunes, YouTube, and Amazon Prime. And that's all I know. All right. Well, hey, it's exciting. You know, kind of can't wait to see what's next. Or yeah, thing, right? for so. sure. Okay, well, hey, let's shift gears. Um, you have a film that is bilingual, which you would think would be, you know, easy to do, right? Just find someone who speaks French, someone who speaks English, and bada boom, bada bing. 
but apparently I, there's more work involved. Yeah, I thought it was pretty easy. I never even thought about the fact before I started that I was going to have to go through as many hoops as I did. I really did think, I didn't even think, oh, we've got two languages and two continents. Like, how are we going to make this work? Like, I never thought about that. Uh, in the beginning, it was only just, well, are we going to get the locations? Do we have access? I never thought in the beginning, how do we manage a dual language, dual country project? <laughs> so well, now you have. <laughs> yeah. So lesson to filmmakers out there, when you are considering a dual language or, you know, if you have multiple languages in your film, I would certainly suggest planning all that out and thinking through lo the logistics of that and hiring the people to translate and transcribe before you ever begin that. So. So uh, we'd like to introduce our special guest, uh, Michelle, if you'd like to come on out. This is co-producer, translator extraordinaire, Michelle Coupe. Michelle, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you. I'm so excited Hi. to be here. So nervous, where, where are you excited. broadcasting from, Michelle? I am broadcasting from my husband's office, but um, located in Saint-Martin-de-Varville, um, which is just between Utah Beach and Sainte Mary Glees in Normandy. So what, now it is one almost 1.30 Central Standard Time in the United States. What time is it where you are? Yeah, so it's 8.30 and we're loving this time of the year because as you can tell, I mean, it's still light outside. So it's, it's, really, it's really great. So 8.30 our time. Let me just say one thing about how light it is at 8.30, uh, starting a little bit before this time, and I didn't know it till I went to France, but it really does start to stay lighter so much later. And that was one trouble that, um, well, it was sort of a trouble and it also sort of helped. But when uh, the guys were dropped uh, on, you know, the night of June 6th, you hear um, Denise LeConte in our film say, it was so bright. Well, that's because they started being dropped around 11, 15, 11, 30, and it can stay bright till almost midnight. Um, so it's a, it's a very unique situation in the summer months there in Normandy. And I remember you're thrown off completely because when I was there, you wouldn't get hungry for dinner until it got dusk. But at that point, it's like 10 or 10, 30. And so it's a very strange, it throws you all off. Does that happen when you live there year round? Or do you just go to sleep when it's 8.30 or 9, even though it's bright? Right. No, it does make a difference. And in, in the, um, you know, we spend a lot more time outdoors. So um, in the afternoon, you start gardening or in the evening. And next thing you know, because it's still light outside, you're like, oh my gosh, it's, you know, it's 8, 8.30 and I haven't started dinner. And, you know, the kids are still, you know, playing or doing whatever. And so, yeah, it does kind of, I never get, I still don't get used to it. That was so, it's, it's still um, something that happens every time. It's, but I love it. You know, I love, <laughs> we go for walks, you know, at 11 o'clock at night and it's still practically daylight. So it's, it's really fantastic. I love it. I love it. <laughs> but I, I do remember uh, you talking about, you know, filming when um, here in Normandy and in the planning stages, you know, they were like, oh, we want to do a sunset, um, uh, film and uh, shoot and we're like okay but you realize that you know sunset's going to be like you know 10 o'clock 10 30 at night and they're like oh no <laughs> think about that so that kind of makes a difference on when when we could start things or when we could when we could film yeah for sure that was a very much a logistics thing yes Michelle, maybe you could, uh, before you share with us what you did on the film uh, as the co-producer and translator, maybe share a little bit about, about your background, you know, your, how you are bilingual and, and, you know, what led up to you doing translation. Uh, yeah, so I um, met my husband um, in the United States at Ohio University, um, and we fell in love and got married, and um, my husband is from Normandy. He's from the area between Bayeux and saint And so um, he wanted to come back to France. So in 2001, we moved back here, um, or I moved here, he moved back, and um, we started our family. So um, I came to, we moved to Normandy um, 13 years ago. 
And um, I sell my first D-Day events here in the area. Um, well, actually, well, in the American sector at Utah Beach, because actually arriving and being in, involved with Lillian's family, um, I think that was something that I was so surprised. And, and what I can relate to with Christian is her reaction coming here for the first time is seeing what the French do for um, the American soldiers and allied soldiers. And um, and so I was just amazed to hear Lilian's family talk about the, the occupation, about the liberation. Um, and so, you know, every dinner, and it's, and it's true when French people say that, every dinner finished with a story about the war and, um, and what they went through and anecdotes, funny or sad. And so it was, um, it, it really I became probably more informed um, about World War II and what happened and what took place just by being here in Normandy and listening to those stories. So um, I'm probably losing the uh, train of thought here, but yes, so, um, so I became involved with um, D-Day uh, commemorations in the area. Um, as a translator, uh, actually that happened uh, first, I volunteered to, um, since I spoke both French and English, to, to translate, to, to help with either speeches or just even, you know, on site being there to help um, the Americans and the French communicate. And, um, and so it just kind of took off from there and became involved with local veteran associations. So how, how did you meet Christian and how did she rope you into all of this? Let's hear that story. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was just about to suggest you ask her that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, how did we meet? So Christian, uh, it, the funny thing was um, when Christian first came um, and what year was that with Hunter? Uh, so it was 2015, 2015, 2015. with Hunter. So in 2015, um, I did not meet Christian. And the funny thing is, is I was going back through some film footage of um, ceremonies in the area looking for something. And um, I came across a ceremony at Carrollton. And so, you know, it's kind of spanning the, the audience. And in the middle of the audience is Christian. And I pause it and I was like, oh, there she is. And then just um, two rows behind, there I was. And I was standing there with a group of a vet another veterans group. And so we were at this same ceremony, probably you know, 20 or 30 feet separated us and we never met. Um, and so we did meet uh, when Christian uh, started to um, launch the, the project with Flo Boucherie. Let and me tell so, this part, if you don't uh, mind. Let sure. me tell this part, if you don't mind, simply because I want filmmakers to think about this. And you wouldn't know this um, because uh, you don't know how we found you. Uh, so the way that I found you was I had talked with Flo probably for about two years and figured out what I wanted to do with the story. Then the next part was, well, how do we do this story? How do we find access and can we find any funding? So I then went on to some films that I knew had been filmed there. One of them was called The Mother of Normandy, Simone Renault, The Mother of Normandy. And I went to look at the IMDb page uh, of this film and I think I may have even watched the film and at the end it always shows you who supported the film so I took those films and I began looking at who the supporters were of previous films and decided to reach out to them so I suggested that Flo call these organizations that were on the you know in the credits and one of them was the A. Uh, the AVA is what it was and I had no idea what it was but Flo called and she said I spoke with someone. I think she's American. You really need to talk with her. And I was like, really? So I wrote her back and I told her I would love to talk with her when she had time. And she said, I'm on my way to the United States. I can talk with you when I get there. And I was like, well, where are you going? She said, Michigan City, Indiana. And I was like, oh, that is only an hour or so away from me. Can I meet with you? And I basically invited myself to her family vacation. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so she graciously <laughs> said, sure, you can be with us for this day. Like I didn't even give her the choice. I was like, I'm showing up no matter what. So anyway, why don't you explain it from there? Uh, you know, how, what you thought about that and then kind of what happened the rest of the day. Um, yeah, so it kind of uh, goes back to um, what I had said earlier. So Christian, you know, had contact of the association. Um, we met, you know, I was all on board um, when she sent that first email about what her, her project, um, what she was thinking of for this for this project. And, and I knew immediately that I wanted to help because that was just something that I is close to my own heart and, um, and, and had the same reaction that Christian had when she came over. So I immediately just, it didn't really take much for her to convince me. I was, I was on board and uh, because of Christian, because of her, you know, her passion and her excitement and um, obviously the subject matter, you know, I mean, just uh, wanting to bring together the, the French and American um friendship and um, relationship. And, and of course, you know, doing, I wanted to be able to give back to the veterans as well. And so this was kind of a way to be able to do that. So Michelle, can you describe, uh, you give some examples, what, what was your role as a translator? It, 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 again, we were joking that it seems like it should be pretty easy. You just hear what they say in French and translate it to English and vice versa. Uh, maybe talk about what your job as a translator was on this film? Um, so Christian um, had, I was already committed with a veterans association um, to help bring over veterans for the D-Day commemorations. And so I had already made this commitment to them. Um, so when Christian and the team was coming over to film, um, I would not have been able to, I wasn't able to um, do any in a lot of the translating. So she brought over Michelle Phoenix, who is an incredible translator. And not only a translator, she's an interpreter. So she does, she was fantastic about doing the on the spot um, translating, which is in itself very different from translating on paper. And, and I'm much better at translating on paper than translating on, on site, um, on the spot. And so, um, so Michelle Phoenix did a fabulous job with all the interviews um, while they were here filming. And, um, and, and, and I had to do some when she had left. Um, and so I, I helped in that capacity. Um, but my main role as a translator came afterwards and it was translating um, on paper, um, written translations of all the interviews and the hundreds of hours of, of interviews that we had. And the, so the challenges were trying to figure out how best to do that. And so, yeah, we went through so many different um, methods of trying to, to do translations to, to be able, because there was transcribing and then there was translating. So, um, cause you had to change, transcribe what they were actually saying in French because eventually too, that was necessary and needed for subtitling purposes. Um, and so transcribing what they said in French and then also translating all of that into English. So for that one, Christian um, and Bill while editing would be able to know what they were saying. And then um, for two, eventually for subtitling purposes as well. So. There, there were a lot of challenges <laughs> with the translating. Had you ever done a film before? Um, actually, no, I never, I've, um, so my, as I said, the translating that I do is typically written translations. And, um, and, and I hadn't done any film work before and it's completely different. And I even think um, translating film, um, is different from even translating a documentary because a, a documentary is, you know, those aren't actors, there's no script. And so the people are just talking and some are better than others. And, and so in, in translating that you, you had to do the good and, and the, and the bad. So the, the stumbling, the fumbling, uh, trying to find words, um, and that, that also was was not difficult to translate, but it just made it it harder 
to, um, to piece together. And, um, and so, yeah, so whereas a script, you know, for a film, I think it's more concise, it's more, um, pers- you know, it's, it's written and advanced. And so I think it's a little bit, probably a little bit easier to translate than um, a documentary where, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not scripted. Well, and I would say in regards to that, when you're transcribing or translating a script, you really only have to do that script. What was different with our project, the documentary film project, we had 31 French interviews. But because I didn't understand French, I couldn't really even understand or remember what they were saying. So it was being translated live in my ear, and I was interacting with the interviewee. But I wasn't able to remember that once I got back to the editing suite. I was only in the moment. So until I had the written transcripts, I couldn't look at exactly what they were saying and figure out how I wanted to use them in the story. So that meant that Michelle had to translate 31 French interviews for me. And I had to read through every one and pull out uh, which interviews captured exactly what I wanted to use in the film. And on top of that, not only were we having to capture what was actually said, but we had to think about of the people that we interviewed, which ones were the most compelling on camera and which ones conveyed the message of what we wanted. So perhaps you had somebody that was very articulate, but they weren't um, compelling on camera. You know, she would have translated all that. I would have read all that, but then I didn't use it in the end. Uh, And that did happen. Um, Because something that on paper is a very profound moment, if it's not said in a profound way, then you don't use it. You can't use it. Uh, So, Michelle, that was the um, the first hurdle. We had to get all of those 31 interviews in French just so I could figure out which ones I wanted to use. And our situation was doubly challenging because uh, the person that was in charge of translating those interviews from the beginning didn't do what they were supposed to do. I think they translated one out of 31 interviews by the end of December. And so we weren't even able to put an assembly edit together until February, mid-February. And we were supposed to be screening in Normandy 10 weeks later. So not only did Michelle have to do these 31 interviews, but she had to do them in a very short timeline. And uh, someone finally did, that same person who didn't get them on in time, did come up with a way. And so the way was we put all of the videos into a French transcriber. And so the French transcriber gave you a very rough script of the French translation, and it was not good. And then to save Michelle time, instead of taking each script and translating into English, we then put it into Google Translate. And now we have this (laughs) bad French transcription being translated by Google Translate very poorly. And then Michelle, like Bill and I tried to edit off of that, that paper document. We tried to, it had now been transcribed badly, translated badly. And we just decided to try to figure out what they were saying and if we could, but then we realized we couldn't do that. We had to know exactly what they were saying and it had to be well-written in French for us to understand. And that is where a personal translator comes on board. We even, after she translated it, we would begin to tweak the language uh, because in the edit, what she would say in a very long, you know, wonderful way, it was too long for like the screen. So then we had to get her to have economy of words that captured the same meaning. And so that would mean retranslation once we got it in the film. So, Michelle, you can elaborate on that because you were the one that had to go through the experience. Right. And so that was the the next challenge then. So um, after all the transcribing and the translating, um, then there's subtitling. And, and so all these are, are slightly so different. Um, and so with the subtitling, um, you know, you can translate 
And, and that's kind of another um, issue with translating. Um, <laughs> I was um, updating my resume the, um, the other week um, for translations. And so, you know, I wanted to come up with a, a quote to kind of put on my resume something about translation and so i was looking up quotes online and i came across this now this is very um oh, it's very uh male chauvinist kind of a, a quote um but it it was and if i if i could only do accents i would do it in this thick russian accent but there's this russian proverb that says um translation is like a woman <laughs> so if it's faithful it's not beautiful. And if it's beautiful, then it's not faithful. And so, um, and I had to laugh at that because it's, it, because it's kind of true. And, and so I don't want to compare it to a woman, obviously, but um, translations, um, a lot of times if they're very faithful to what a person has said, it doesn't necessarily always come across as, as very pretty. Um, and so, and if you, translate it to make it flow better or sound better or sound prettier, then it's not always necessarily um, faithful to that original um, voice. So that's um, one thing, that's a, you know, one major challenge of, of translating. And one thing I didn't want to lose in the translations of um, the interviews was that person's voice also. Um, you know, I think it's important that that the people, um, the viewers have an idea of what that person, without knowing what they're saying, what they're hearing, so that in written form, it has to come across to give an idea of the, the personality of that, of that person. So um, certain expressions or certain way of, of speaking, I think needed to come across in the translation and in the subtitling. And as Christian was saying, so, you know, subtitling, is a whole nother um, a whole nother um, issue because you you've got to make it readable and and quickly on a screen. So um, you really have to you know economize with words, but then too you have to think of closed captioning. So which is another I know you had talked about that on other. Um, podcast is is so you have subtitling and then you have closed captioning which you know has to correspond directly almost with what the person is saying so it's it's all very challenging and kind of uh confusing and not always easy to to be successful at really here here's the telling question though would you ever do a film again Yes, I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so yeah. you're you're, you're right. hired. <laughs> yes, you are hired. In yeah, fact, I'm lined up already. So get, <laughs> buckle your seatbelt. Yeah, in fact, she is on my next film, although she's going to have to learn Dutch pretty quickly. Oh. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I will use her co-producer skills in the next film because she didn't have a clue about what it meant to be on a film set. But now that she has run the gauntlet of every single thing that we've needed, she does have a much better understanding and she is in Europe. And so she certainly can be helpful that way. Um, by the time that we went for our pickup shoot, I said to her at one point, she was doing things without being told to do things in our pickup shoot. So we were there in June. She worked for, you know, six weeks. And then um, in December, we had her working again. And at one point she was moving things around. I don't know if they were microphones or cameras or Pelican cases and telling people where to go and what to do. And I looked at her and I said, you have become a producer. And she looked at me like, what? And I was like, yeah, this is exactly, it's now instinctual to you. And um, so she's really grown a lot. And I'd love to see that growth and her grow into that role. Um, you know, interestingly enough, one of the other skills you alluded to, but didn't actually, uh, you know, enumerate is that not only does she have to be able to hear and translate and then write it out in written translation and constantly revise. Um, and then like she said, subtitle in the film, that's a different skill that we had to use. And she had to be computer savvy 
to work in these files that we needed. So many people in the film business know for subtitling or closed captioning, you have to have an SRT file. Um, Michelle had to learn this. Michelle, you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, so that was um, that was very interesting as well, and I and I really love learning about that process, and um, because the and it, it is something that I, I guess I need to learn more about as well. But I just thought it was really interesting about you know the time codes and trying to to match up the subtitles with the with the voice. And, um, and and the timing of it so that it does, um, the subtitles, uh, you know, can go over different frames or double up with the next frame. And that was really fun working with you and Bill on that. I know we had a lot of uh, good laughs. Um, I just have to say too that Christian and Bill both improved their French uh, and, and incredibly because of having to do all the editing on the French side and, be, and with the time difference, which is another added challenge to this whole process was, um, you know, so they would start working basically because they'd have to work toward the end of their day and um, in the afternoon to the evening. So that would be in the middle of the night in, in my time. So sometimes I would either have to stay up late or they would start editing on their own. And then the next morning I would come in and have to, you know, revise um, or approve what, you know, what they were able to do. And toward the end, they were getting like really good about uh, being able to edit even without me. So, but yeah, so then at the end, just coming back in and just, you know, going through everything and the subtitling, um, just making sure it all matched up was, was another big step in the process as well. I wish that Bill was here because we had, you know, he played a big role in this because he had to, once the subtitles were in, he couldn't really edit well until he saw on the screen exactly what the words were saying. And so, and then there would be times where we would want to cut, we'd want to keep most of the interview, but we would need to cut out this tiny little piece, even if it was for time or if it was for understanding. And so, us not knowing the French very well in the very beginning was painstaking because we would have to say to Michelle, we want to cut this tiny little piece, um, but can you show us where to cut? So in that vein, Michelle was acting as an editor. So it is crazy just to think about what skills she acquired going through this process with us. It was remarkable. Well, uh, Michelle, do you have any advice as we wrap up here for uh, any first time filmmakers who have a bilingual film? Um, yeah, I would just say really to think about the process of, um, of how you're going to, um, to, to do it. You know, I think we didn't have that process in place in the beginning. Um, I think, you know, at first it was great for the interviews, you know, they had thought through that. They even had the earpieces for the translating um, or interpreting during the interview, which was, which was fantastic. But there was, you know, we didn't have anything in place afterwards about, um, about translating and how to make that work. And um, I think have we had a process in place um, to begin with and, you know, me not being um, not having been in the film industry before or the filmmaking process, you know, I didn't even really know what was available as far as um, transcribing. And and so I think that really is really something that needs to be thought out before. But it's, it's, it's definitely possible. So but it just needs to be to be worked out. <laughs> Planning ahead, a, a theme in Christian's film brought up yet again. <laughs> in every film, in every film. Um, we do really have to go soon, but Jason, I just want to hear from you. Do you have any questions or anything? No, I'm just kind of amazed at how you were able to work out a system like just so, you know, without, without pre-planning it you were able to figure it out on the back end and i'm just kind of in awe of that so i'm just really thankful for both of you for for making the film and working together because that sounds like quite a challenge <laughs> 
Yeah, it was. And I appreciate that. Honestly, if it wasn't for someone like Michelle, Michelle had been a volunteer and she'd known that before and she was willing and passionate about this. And she could re, um, she was very flexible and willing to re, you know, learn everything on the fly. So my advice is find someone like that to head up the translation, transcription, subtitling department, somebody that does have experience, that is flexible, that is passionate about your film, and someone that you really love working with. I remember the very first day that I spent that day with her in Michigan City at the beach. At the end of it, I said, if you agree to do this, we will become very good friends. And that is absolutely what happened. Michelle is one of my dearest friends. And because of that, I introduced her to Flo. And now she and Flo are very good friends. And, um, you know, we will be friends for life. I almost decided to buy a house near Michelle Coupe that was for sale in her neighborhood because she's become such a dear friend. So that's my advice. Yes. And before we um, before we go to, I just wanted to... Um, really thank Christian for um, bringing me aboard this project. And um, because it was really um, an opportunity of the life of my lifetime and um, such an enriching experience um, in, in every aspect from start to finish and um, something that I probably never would have been able to do and I learned so much um, about the filmmaking process, about the film industry, about myself, about what I was capable of, of doing. And, and I, that's where Christian is such a champion, I think, because she is so encouraging. And, um, you know, she attracts um, talented people like herself. And um, not only that, but she's able to bring everybody together as a team and and just um, has made the super team. And it's no surprise that the film has won so many awards that it's already won because of, of people like Christian and the team that she was able to put together. You're making me blush. Thank you. <laughs> Michelle, you get prized for best guest ever. <laughs> that was best. awesome. And I'm well, losing, hey. we're losing our sunlight. It yes, I can tell. Today. You're getting darker and darker. Yeah, no, 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 it's getting darker. Well, that should be a sign for us to say goodbye. So Christian, <laughs> is there anything you need to say before we sign out? Nope. I mean, just go to the girl who wore freedom.com slash donate. If you can, we still are really, really running short of funds for next month um, or buy something in the store. And uh, if you can watch us at one of these film festivals, uh, the Julian one is not online, but the one after that is the GI film festival. And that one will be online. So keep your eye out on our website for that. The girl who wore freedom.com slash festivals. Awesome. Well, Hey, Thank you for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Bye, everybody.